Okay, good afternoon. It is Monday the 13th and we're up to video 6. Um, pages 113 to 140. Hope you're having a great day. Nearly to the holidays. Bye. Dad left Miles to clean the boat and deal with the cannery again. Deal with the men in white plastic with blood and fish guts all over them. Men with sharp knives and no smiles, soaked in fluoro light. That's what it was like in the cannery. Fish guts and blood. It stunk of warm fish skin and bleach. And everyone who worked there smelled like that too. It didn't wash away. The fish oil soaked inside their skin and it stayed. Most kids ended up working there. Miles knew them, kids from school who left before the end of year nine. But they didn't look like kids anymore. They were hard, just big arm muscles and thick hands, gutting and finning salmon from the salmon ponds, shucking the abalone and canning them. And Dad said Miles would end up there if he didn't work hard, if they lost the boat. It was already dark when Dad picked him up and he didn't stay, say where he'd been. He just drove fast, took corners fast and Miles had to hold on to the door to stay in his car seat and not slide across and hit Dad. Now that Martin was out of the way, Jeff was in Dad's ear all day telling him that they should start diving over at Acton Island or down the Cape. Why are we wasting time? We can't compete with these big boats, he sa he'd say. He talked out about other places too, all of them out of the fishing zone and in the afternoon Dad would go off in the ute with Jeff, maybe somewhere down the coast where they could poach close to the shore without being seen. Under the high cliffs and the rocks down there where there were no roads, in the mornings there would be a few tubs of abalone already on the boat, big fat abalone. When they got to the straight hard bit of road dad pushed the ute even faster. Miles looked up ahead and in the blackness maybe 200 metres off there was huge headlights of a truck coming, coming down and dad wasn't even on his side of the road. He was in the middle of the road like always, driving right in the middle of the road. Miles kept his eyes on the truck on the headlights maybe 100 meters away now then light, the lights went out the truck was gone there was only the sound of the truck and the sound of the ute moving on the road in the dark dad's face was blank miles went to say something to yell out pull over but the truck was suddenly there suddenly right on them the full force of its horn filled the air and the night and the cabin and Miles could feel how close the truck was. He could feel the centimetres between them. And in the headlights of the ute, Miles saw it, a bull on its side being pushed by the truck, its hulking body covering a space where the headlights should have been. A massive bull. Miles could even see one of its horns. The truck must have hit it on the road and must have hit it up where the lights had blacked out. And Miles didn't know how the truck hadn't hit them too. He looked up at Dad, his eyes still fixed ahead, and then he turned and watched the red taillights of the truck fly away into the night. It hadn't even tried to slow down, and neither had Dad. Jake alternated between leading and following on the narrow track through the scrub, and the ground was really wet here. Wet from the river and wet from the rain. Harry had never seen, been this way before. Not this far upstream, no one came up here really but George seemed to know the way and it looked like all this land had been cleared once a long time ago when the forest was cleared it never looked right when it grew back it was missing bits there was no moss or ferns or dark hard dark hardwood trees just tall scrappy gum trees and grasses and shrubs they climbed a small hill and from the top Harry could see the bigger blue hills in the distance a sea of blue forests going on forever but below in the valley, the layout of the land was clear. There were paddocks, old wooden stump posts, old sheds, and as they got closer, Harry could see the blackened stone foundations of a building, a house, the brick chimney still standing, but slightly crumpled on the one side where the bricks ha had fallen loose. George put his backpack down, got out some hessian sacks and handed one to Harry, and Harry could smell them. The red apples, sweet and bubbling, ripe to bursting. It didn't take long before his sack was heavy with them. He could only reach the low branches, but the old orchard was so overgrown, the trees weighted and full. Rotten fruit was, th fruit was thick on the ground. He'd better watch out for snakes because there would be rats around. He'd heard some scurrying before, and Jake was barking and running like mad. 
chasing rats and taking bites of fallen apples. He had one in his mouth now and he brought it over. It's slimy and half rotten, but Harry took it anyway. He chucked it as far as he could and Jake leapt after it. Harry looked up at George. Is this your place? He asked suddenly. George let his full sack rest down on the earth. He looked at Harry. Yes, he said. Where you grew up? He nodded. He picked up the sack again. It was time for lunch. Harry had taken his jumper off while they were picking and he'd enjoy the winter sun on his bare arms. But now that he was sitting down, he was cold again. George lit a fire, poured some water from his flask into the billy. He got out some bread and using a large rock as a cutting board, he cut through a few slices. Jake got up from where he was lying and moved closer to the food. There was butter and some smoked orange fish that looked sticky. It glistened like it had been varnished. Harry didn't like smoked fish, but he didn't say anything. He didn't want to be rude. He watched George put some butter on the bread and a thick slice of fish. Then he took an apple out of his pocket, cut some into thin slices and laid them on top of the fish. Harry took the bread in his hands and he could smell the fish, but he was hungry. So he closed his eyes and took a bite. It was salty, but sweet too. And with the apple and the butter, it tasted good. The water in the billy started bubbling. George added loose tea and took the billy off the fire using a stick. When the metal handle had cooled down a bit, he grabbed it in his hand and swung the billy from side to side with quick, sharp movements. He poured the black tea into two white chip tin mugs and there was no loose tea in, it, in them, not even one leaf. There was no milk, but Harry didn't mind. The warm mug in his hand and the fire were making him feel good, good and warm and tired. He looked around at the old farm. He had so many questions that he wanted to ask George, like why don't you live here instead of in the marshy paddock? And how did the fire start that burned down the house? But he only asked one question. Do you remember your mum and dad? George nodded his head slowly. He put his cup down and rolled up his sleeves. Harry saw for the first time that George's scars weren't just on his hands and face. The bubbled white and pink shiny skin went all the way up both arms. Sometimes I don't remember, Harry said. Sometimes I can't remember, Mum. He caught a glimpse of her in his head, just a flash, every now and then, and he tried hard to hold on to them. But he wasn't sure he knew the lady in the f photographs at home. He wasn't sure he knew her. Dad doesn't like me very much, he said. George finished his tea in one big gulp and put his cup down again next to Harry's on the dirt and he squeezed Harry's shoulder. He told Harry all about mum when she was young, what he remembered. Back at the shack, George gave Harry a small bag of apples to take home. But Harry said no. Dad will ask me where I got them, he said. George put the bag down on the table. He took out two apples and slipped them into the pockets of Harry's parka. On the way home, Harry took an apple out of his pocket and rubbed it against his pants. He took a bite. It was sweet and the juice ran down his chin, and it was good like sunshine, like the inside of an apple pie. He was glad George had shown him the farm, the place he grew up. He knew they were real friends now. A car pulled up the driveway, a new car, dark blue and shiny. Harry held onto the curtains and kept them tightly shut with just enough space for one of his eyes to see out of the window. A man and a woman got out of the car and they were wearing it uniforms like police uniforms. But they weren't police uniforms. There was a knock on the door. Harry stood still. They knocked again. The door wasn't locked and if the man and the woman tried it, it would open and they could see him hiding by the curtains. He moved closer to the door. Yes, he said. Officer Warren Smith and Officer Taylor here. Are your mum and dad at home? It was a woman's voice and Harry reached out and touched the door handle. He opened the door a tiny way and put his face through the crack. The woman was short with blonde hair and she looked quite nice. The man stood behind her and he was trying to see past Harry into the house. My mum's dead, Harry said. The man and the woman looked at each other. Is your dad at home? The woman asked. Harry shook his head and he let the door fall open a bit wider. He's on the boat. The woman looked down at the folder she was carrying and she wrote something down. And that's Mr Curran, Mr Stephen Curran. Harry nodded. Now the man was staring at him. He wasn't smiling. At home on your own, he said. How old are you? Harry looked down at the worn out doormat encrusted with mud. My aunt's coming, he said. The woman tucked the folder under her arm. We need to speak to your dad. You say he's out on his boat. Then the man said, we're from fisheries. Your dad's license is not valid. Unpaid fines and a long list of infringements. We need to speak with him. 
Harry could feel the man staring at him and he wanted to say that maybe he'd been wrong, that Dad might not be on the boat and that he was probably up at the shops. But he couldn't make himself say anything. He just kept his eyes focused on the doormat and waited for them to leave. The woman said goodbye, but the man didn't. Harry shut the door and he heard the man say, What a shithole. And he heard the car doors close. They must be from Huonville or maybe Hobart. From the window, Harry watched him reverse down the drive and he thought maybe he'd go out for a while, at least until Miles got home. Sometimes mist hung in the air, still and wet, and it wouldn't move or disintegrate or change all day because the heat from the sun wasn't strong enough. It would take the afternoon wind off the ocean to break it up, to chase it away. Miles walked up to Grandad's house after work. There was a for sale sign in the front paddock nailed to a fence post and it was almost empty now. The house, broken chairs and full green bin bags left on the veranda. An old phone book on the floor in the middle of the lounge room, a chip cup on the kitchen bench, all of Joe's stuff gone, but there were signs that they had been here. All of them. Deep grooves on the floorboards in the hallways and near the doors. Soot in the fireplace, brown smoke. Stains on the mantelpiece. Harry's treasure hunt items left hanging from the windows and resting in, on the sills. Joe had told Harry he could choose three for the boat and the rest had to go, but Harry hadn't chosen any pieces yet. He just kept walking around the empty house looking at them all. Sometimes he'd pick up a shell or a bone and something and hold it for a while. Sometimes he would say something like, I found this at Cockle Creek or Cuttlefish are smart, but he always put the items back down again. Miles found the old carved notches in the kitchen door, the marked heights of all of them, of Mum and Auntie Jean, Harry and Joe. Miles ran his finger along the last marking for him. It was hard to believe he had ever been so small. He was smaller than Harry was now. He was always thought he would live here one day. He walked outside and opened the door to the workshop. The workbenches and metal lathes were still there, too heavy to move, and there were piles of collected wood stacked in the corner. Not wood for fires, but good wood. Supple wood, full of oil. Grandad's wood. Grandad had made beautiful things. He had made wood glow and shine, and Miles was going to be just like him. He didn't want to just be a carpenter like Joe. He didn't want to build houses and kitchens or fixtures on boats. He was going to make furniture, good furniture, just like Grandad. Miles walked into the workshop. He picked up a small gnarled piece of King Billy from the pile and he breathed it in. It smelled of the earth, even after all this time. They stood among the destruction, smiling at the abundance. Myrtle, blackwood, King Billy pine, strewn left behind, there for the taking. A freshly logged coop. Jesus, Miles, look at all the bloody wood. Miles could smell the wood, the pie and the earth. He looked around, rubbing his hands on his corduroy pants. What should we get, he asked, and Grandad grinned. As much as we can load up, as much as we can bloody load up. They started filling the trailer, large pieces first, and Miles was actually helping for once, managing to carry some heavy timber by himself. There were a few good-sized logs, big enough for coffee table or bedside cabinets. All the smaller bits were good for the lathe, chair legs, bowls and lampstands. Miles found a big chunk of King Billy dripping with sap. Billy was his favourite, the way it smelled sweet like honey. The pink flesh so tightly packed it was as strong as stone and it was the best wood he knew. Something made of Billy could last forever if you made it properly, if you worked the wood right. Maybe we'd find some Huon, he said, and Grandad winked. Used to be everywhere when I was a kid, you know, and Miles did know. When he closed his eyes, he could see it. The Huon pine growing soft and silent by the rivers. The trees reaching wide out of the dark valleys, so perfect. And they would never come back like that, not even in a million years. Got your eye on a piece, Grandag asked. Miles nodded, but didn't point it out. He'd leave that till later. He knew Grandad would be surprised because it was just a small piece, and it wasn't Billy. It was a soft bit of cherry top. The grain bold and clear and ready to shine. He could see that it could be what it could be and how he could sculpt it on a lathe and it would be for Joe, for the boat he was going to build. Something just for luck. Miles heard Joe's van pull up the drive and he put the old bit of billy he was holding back on the pile and he went outside. He waved to Joe and he thought that whoever bought the house would probably think all that wood was just for the fire. 
Miles watched Joe mark out huge arcs on the slate green lines. He was wild, moving so fast he was flying, but Miles couldn't move. He just stood still at the top of the cliff, hardly breathing, watching the water below churn and run. It was shit that Joe had brought him here. Southport Bluff was rocky and rippy and a steep heavy chunk of water that jacked up over the Black Reef. People called it the Boneyard. Maybe because of all the old shipwrecks or maybe because the reef would break your bones. Miles didn't know, but he'd seen Joe get smashed there here before, pummeled by thick white water dragged backwards over the reef, had the skin on his hands and feet ripped away, and Joe was much bigger than he was. He was just a kid, a baby. He was nothing. The light was going. Soon it would be too late. Joe was leaving, leaving, and Joe had yelled at him before and said that Miles was going to get stuck, stuck working for Dad, stuck being responsible for Harry, stuck being responsible for everything. He said that Miles was always scared of the wrong things. I bet every bit of you is screaming on the inside, Miles. And it was. Miles could feel it. His jaw tight, his fists clenched, just standing there with his wetsuit on and his board under his arm, just standing there like he was dead. But he moved. He started running, skidding blindly down the steep rocky path, unable to stop, too scared to stop. At the bottom he picked up his long his way along the exposed reef until the cold water hit his feet. He threw himself off the edge of the world without even thinking without breathing. He just paddled with everything and Joe was hooting and clapping and giving Miles the strength to paddle faster. He felt the lines punch hard underneath him, pick him up like he was just a leaf, a piece of seaweed. But he wasn't scared now, not of this, it was simple, what he needed. The rise and fall of the ocean breathing and someone out there who felt it too. Joe understood, he lived for this, for these moments when everything stops except your heart beating and at time bends and ripples, moves past your eyes frame by frame and you feel beyond time and before time and no one can touch you. When he reached the main break it was bigger, thicker than it had looked from up high on the cliff, the back of the wave almost as steep as the face so that the peaks and troughs were metres apart. But Miles kept his eyes on Joe's eyes, kept his eyes fixed right on Joe. This next line, his <coughs> this wave was going to take him whether he liked it or not he turned he waited for that feeling when the back of your board gets lifted for the moment when you are collected and his body knew how he knew what to do when to lean in and when to pull back that drop rolling out fast everything fell out of his mind he could see it all now right in front of him See the edge ridges, the curves, see the colour of the water as it moved in the fading light. It was time to do something, time to make something of his own. Getting changed, Joe and Miles were laughing at nothing, laughing at everything. Joe couldn't find one of his socks and Miles got his wetty stuck on one arm and he couldn't get it free. It was freezing and windy but Miles laughed so much his face hurt. He still couldn't believe he had surfed. Southport Bluff. He'd done it, caught a really big waves that were well overhead. They were still running through him in the car with the headlights on and his body relaxed. It was dead weight cradled in the bucket seat, but Joe didn't start the car. His hands were on the steering wheel, but they didn't move. He just sat there and stared straight ahead. I thought I'd leave tomorrow, he said after a while. He looked at Miles with more big swell coming. If I don't leave now, then it might be weeks before I can get out across the strait. Miles couldn't think of anything to say. There was nothing. Joe said it was probably the best if he didn't see Harry before he, because he wouldn't be able to explain and that maybe Miles could explain it better. And the whole time Joe looked weird and his eyes were wide and red and he looked like he was scared. You can tell him from me and tell him I'm coming back. Miles wanted to get out of the car. He wanted to get the feeling back that he'd just had five minutes ago. He couldn't look at Joe. He pushed his body as far away as he could so that he was jammed right up against the door with the handle pushing into his ribs. Joe's hands were still on the steering wheel, squeezing and steer the steering wheel. Miles thought he might be crying. I just got to get out of here, he said. It was quiet except for the sound of Joe and Miles wanting to tell him to shut up. He wanted to ask him what he was crying for, what he had to cry about. 
He didn't have to live with Dad and work on the boat. He didn't have to look after Harry. Joe didn't park in the drive. He pulled up on the side of the road with the house just in view and he left the engine on. What time are you going? Joe shrugged early, I guess, and Miles knew in his guts that Joe was ready to go right now, that he would probably slip out tonight and that's what this afternoon had been about. He'd planned this, the whole thing, the surf, all of it. Miles pulled the handle on the passenger door, <coughs> opened it, and Joe reached out and grabbed his arm. I'll be back, Miles. I will. Miles kicked up the door open wider and swung his legs out. I'm only 19, Miles. I'm only 19. Miles shut the door. He walked up the drive and thought that when he was 19, Harry would be nearly 15, and they would both be the hell of the way from here, too. That's what he thought. But it felt like it would never really happen. It felt like it would never come around for him. Miles knew how to make corned beef hash, only there wasn't any corned beef. Plenty of potatoes though. Do you want mashed potatoes, Harry? Harry was watching TV and he didn't turn around, and, but he said yes. Then he said, what else is there? Miles looked in the cupboard. Tomato sauce, a small tin of baked beans, dry pasta, an onion. Baked beans. Harry nodded. The bright red peeler didn't work anymore. It had rusted solid and no one had ever bothered to throw it out. Miles picked it out of the drawer, touched the rusted blade with his finger. He could use a knife and he got the sharper one out. But then again, potatoes were too dirty. He could just scrub them and mash them with the skin on. No, Harry wouldn't eat that. He'd better peel them. It was hard to cut close to the skin and he ended up losing quite a bit of potato, but there was enough. Potatoes were filling. When mum used to take them up to Hugh and Ville Market, they would always get hot potatoes from the potato man. Little black metal oven full of steaming baked potatoes. One cut in half with melted cheese and coleslaw and herbs and butter oozing would be more than enough. It would keep Miles warm all day, but they didn't have any cheese or butter or any of those other things, just milk. Miles put Harry's serve on a small plate so that it looked like it, there was more food. A small tin of beans didn't go very far and Miles was careful to split the food equally, even though he knew Harry wouldn't eat all of his. Dark outside but still early, they sat and ate their warm beans and mash and Miles knew he would let Harry use the last of the milk for a cup of Milo later and he knew that Harry would ask him about it just as soon as he finished his last mouthful of dinner and then Harry told Miles about the people who had come to the door, about the fisheries.